faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, welcome to the Better Humanology Podcast. Jared Moon here. Uh, today on the podcast, we have John Call. You may know him as Juji Mufu. Uh, so I'm sure you have seen some of his videos. If you don't know who I'm talking about yet, I know you've seen his videos. So this guy, he was on America's Got Talent Season 11. Um, he's the dude who's like super muscular and does the chair splits with a barbell over his head. Uh, so this might start ringing a bell. Um, insanely popular on YouTube, Instagram, all sorts of social media. He has a lot of cool videos. He does a lot of cool stuff. But he runs a website called Acrobolics, and you can check it out at acrobolics.com. Um, but really what this podcast is about is, to me, is what it really takes to master some skills. So if you haven't seen uh, John Call, I mean, just this hugely muscular dude. He's, he's really built... Uh, he's really combined uh, bodybuilding and tricking and and being, you know, doing all sorts of like flips and tricks and all this other crazy stuff. And uh, he can do them both really, really well. But what we kind of dive into in this podcast is the dedication that it takes to master skill like this, how long it actually takes, the expectations, you know, you should have for yourself in developing new skills. And then we even talk about uh, me doing a backflip because that's a, that's a skill that I really want to achieve and he kind of walks me through it. So if you have any interest in in uh, doing a backflip, definitely listen to this podcast episode. But today, John Call, Juji Mufu, listen to it, uh, get every nugget out of it you that you can. Before we go into the podcast, I want to say make sure you go over to endof3fitness.com and sign up for the newsletter. When you get there, you hit the little green button, enter your name, email address, We hook you up with all sorts of free stuff, an invitation to our training. You get our seven-day barbell in-doc program where I walk you through seven days of training, and you can hit that up. Uh, You get our barbell ebook. You get, I mean, man, we just, we, I really try to provide as much value as you can. So uh, on top of that, you, you become part of the newsletter. So when we're doing new things, you get those announcements and opportunities to join. We also run a little, uh, we kind of uh, mimics Tim Ferriss here. We do a five line Friday email every Friday where I try and give you five tidbits of like either helpful resources, free stuff, uh, anything I'm working on, projects, updates. Uh, it really is the place to be. So go to end 3 fitnesscom Make sure you sign up for the newsletter um, and we will hook you up with a bunch of free stuff uh, and you'll get notified when these podcast episodes come out and new articles, all sorts of good stuff, guys. But here is John Call uh, or Juji Mufu. All right, John, I'm super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. I really appreciate it, and thanks for taking time to do this today. Hey, thanks for inviting me, man. I love this stuff. So uh, we like to get started uh, running here in our podcast, and so I always throw it to the guest, uh, put you right under the bus as soon as we start with some challenges. Do you think you could give the listeners a fitness challenge this week? A fitness challenge this week? Yeah, of course. You ready? Yep. Okay, let's try this. I want you guys to pick a movement that you can't do and try to practice to learn it. Now, I mean, most fitness stuff is like how many sets and reps and stuff. Can you do this? Like, how about like a backflip or a cartwheel? Can you do it? So try it. That's your challenge. Try to do something you can't do like that. All right, man. I'm going to try it. All right. And how about a mental toughness challenge? Hmm. Uh, let's let's do this let's uh for a mental toughness challenge how about the one i'm trying to do which is uh just take a cold shower every day i mean it's something simple but you know it provides huge dividends uh after you've been doing it for a little while perfect and then do did you work into that or did you just like uh actually i guess i have two questions because i'm a big cold shower fan do you go hot to cold or do you jump straight into cold depends on how much of a wuss I am for the day. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel when I'm doing it. <laughs> and, and how long do you normally uh, you stay in? The probably cold? probably just about three or five minutes. That's a long time. That's a, that's a good cold shower right there. Is, right. Yeah, I guess it is. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah, it's, it's short. It, it, it's short. All right, man. Uh, and how about a book recommendation? Hmm, how about uh, – can I do two? Yeah. All right. Uh, how about my book? <laughs> 
Okay. Legend, legendary flexibility at legendaryflexibility.com. Uh, it's my flexibility ebook. It took me years to write it. I'm very proud of it. And for something I didn't write, um, you know what? I'm going to go into the other room to grab it real quick so I know the exact title. I stole it from a friend's house. I was at his uh, – crap. My, <laughs> my, my wife moved it. Where'd she put it? Oh, there it is. Okay. I stole it from a friend's house off of his, off of his bookshelf, and it's called Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. M-A-S-O-N-C-U-R-R-E-Y is the guy's name, Mason Curie, Daily Rituals. And it says how great minds make time, find inspiration, and get to work. And uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with Tools of Titans, Tim Ferriss' new book, Mm -hmm. perhaps. This this is sort of like that, except for it's mostly writers and musicians from like hundreds of years ago. And this guy did a lot of research on uh, their daily rituals. And it's hilarious, actually. The book is great because uh, you realize how dysfunctional these, some of these people were. Like, you read about Proust, uh, the, that famous fictional author. If you read about his routine, it'll blow your mind. It's like, how did this guy get anything done? It's just amazing. Yeah. It's it just – it's amazing. I, it's it's an amazing book. I, it's very fun too. Every profile in the book is like one page, so it's like it's so easy to do, and it's just it's a great book. I recommend it. Yeah, I think that's. I actually have read that book, and I think that I don't. I don't think it's been recommended on the podcast, so that's perfect. Uh, but uh, I yeah, I also found it fascinating how many people were like alcoholics or drug users. Oh no. Um, <laughs> yeah, in the with their daily rituals, just like little things that they had that uh, I don't know, but. Uh, in a like in a the to get, to get the creative juices flowing, they'd have like uh, you know like that was their routine. I thought it was very interesting. It's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> it, you know it makes you wonder. Um, not to take up too much time on the podcast with this book recommendation question, but it, it does make you kind of wonder. Like, you know, is you wonder like how did these guys function with with these type of like routines they had? It's so dysfunctional, but. At the same time, it's like maybe there's something to it. I mean, I'm not going to try to like get addicted to opium and heroin, <laughs> heroin and alcohol I mean, like a lot of these guys were, but it's just like there might be something there. Yeah, I mean, the, the guys in the book are some uh, some great minds, so there's there's definitely something in there. Would I officially recommend it? No, but hey, maybe it's yeah. uh, maybe it, it does something for the creativity gene. <laughs> all, right, all right, dude. So let's um. Let's uh, get uh, talking about you for a minute. I want to give uh, get a good background uh, for my listeners, where everyone knows who you are. Um, more popularly known, I think, is Juji Mufu. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So how about you give me a little bit of background on, um, I don't know, how that name started, and then maybe take us from kind of your fitness background and what you're doing today, and then I'll dive in. I'll be I'll be jotting down notes the whole time and dive in after you're done. Okay. Well, I mean, I got the name. Um, I made it up when I was like a a 13-year-old kid. Uh, If you remember America Online, it was was an online login messaging system thing. So I turned 14 years old, and my old screen name was John Call 13. And I was like turning 14. It's like, I need a new one because I'm no longer 13 years old. So I was trying to come up with a cool name. And uh, if you pick something that's already been taken – it's going to append a number at the end of the name. So I didn't want a number on my name. I wanted a unique name. And, you know, I'm a God, I sat there for half an hour before I realized how much time I had wasted there sitting there trying to come up with something cool. And I just got frustrated and just went, uh, Juju Mufu and just spat it out. And man, that was it. It logged me in. I was like, okay, it took it. I guess I'm Juju Mufu. And, you know, I started talking to people online with that name and I just never changed it, man. It's just something I just didn't bother changing. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the earlier times I was involved with something called tricking. I still am. It's still what I do. It's acrobatic uh, martial arts. It's a aesthetic blend of flips, twists, and kicks. So I was logging on to these tricking forums and tricking websites to communicate with other people who did this underground activity, which is still mainly underground today. And, you know, I did that because I was getting involved in martial arts, Taekwondo, when I was around 13 years old. So I was trying to take it to the next level by doing really advanced skills. Um, you know, instead of just the traditional stuff, I wanted to do the crazy crap I was seeing in these videos. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where I got the name and, you know, what I was doing with it online, you know, and, uh, and then moving from there, just, you know, started weightlifting to improve my tricking as I got older, uh, you know, 17, 18 year old, I was like, ah, at that age, I had already recognized that the best athletes in the world all lifted weights. 
all of them were using strength and resistance training to improve their athletic capabilities. So I was like, I'm going to do what they're doing. And so I started lifting weights, but I started taking it pretty seriously because I, you know, I, you know, I loved it for what it was as well. It wasn't, it, it became more than just something just to improve my tricking. It became a, Hey, I like weightlifting too. I like deadlifting. I got bit by the, by the iron bug, so to speak. And, and, uh, you know, fast forward real quick, late twenties now, uh, start bodybuilding because I got tired of just being a, uh, you know, small and strong. I wanted to look the part too. And, you know, started bodybuilding in my late twenties and now I'm 31 and that's where I'm at. I think the big difference between me and a lot of other people that had, transitions in their uh athletic careers is that i continue to do everything as i evolved i i still trick i still train my flexibility i still do a little martial arts i still weight lift. i still bodybuild i just I kept adding to it and that's it that's awesome man and you uh you can do some pretty amazing stuff now i've seen uh videos on your youtube channel and your instagram i mean you have some uh crazy flex- flexibility and some um uh, amazing tricking or, you know, acrobatics, whatever, whatever I call it. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's really, really impressive. Um, and one thing I wanted to know is I, cause I was reading, reading on your website and I was kind of, you know, trying to deconstruct you a little bit. Um, and I was reading some of your articles about training cause that's, uh, training and programming are some of the, what I find most fascinating and, and what I study most, most of the time. And, uh, you said, you know, one of the biggest lessons learned that that you've had over the years, you wish someone would have sat you down and, and told you was the fact that you take these, uh, back off weeks. Um, and then I think I also read that you take off one to two months at a time or something like that. I I, I want to get a little more clarification on that. Um, as opposed to like these like daunting period periodization programs. Uh, can you talk about why you do that and how you, how you fell into this kind of uh, routine? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the article I think you're referencing is one called the uh, the No Season, where you know uh, the thing I I really like to talk um, talk the most about with people is you know how your lifestyle and your life is essentially your training support system. If you know training is one of the things you're most passionate about, you got to look at the big picture here. It's like, I mean if your finances are or your relationships are in chaos, if, if your living situation is just a wreck, if you're completely disorganized, if your clothes are all over the place, if you haven't prepared meals for the week, if, you know, if your desktop is filled with icons from one end to the other for, you know, just files and just all this crap that people overlook and they're too focused on, Hey, let me get on this training program or what's the one thing I need to improve my diet. It's just like, dude, if you get your life in order, your, your training is going to be so much easier. And so the thing is that the article you read called the no season, uh, where I say like no to training for, you know, a period of time in the year is to focus on fixing your life. Cause if you're, if you really get into training like me and you do, and a lot of your listeners, um, it, it becomes something that really taxes you. It drains you. It's just like, you don't realize it, but you know, your deadlifting workout that you went ham on, is just going to put you in a complete brain fog and coma for a few days. You're completely useless. It's just like you can't even function. It's just, your brain just doesn't work. I mean, or if you're on a low carb diet where where you suddenly cut your calories and carbs for some reason, you're in just this kind of haze as you go through your life, and you can't, you don't have any scraps of energy left to really fix the things that are affecting your training in that respect. So you have a lifestyle here that's in, in chaos that's making it really inconvenient for you to train in the first place. And you're training so hard and it's just, it's a bad setup. And so what I recommend people do is look, you would not believe it, but if you just take a month or two off from training, uh, you can still work out. You can go out and play Frisbee or rollerblade or just have some fun here and there. Just don't fucking nuke your brain, you know, with these really hard workouts, just, just take, just take a month or two off, just do it and then fix your life. (laughs) And you come back to it. You'll realize like I can still, I'm almost as strong as I was. I didn't get completely fat. I, I feel pretty good actually. Maybe my body took that pretty well. Maybe it needed a break, you know? So that's sort of a, you know, in my opinion, that's sort of hinting at a, a different sort of use for the the word periodization, uh, which in my opinion is just a fancy way of, uh, scheduling rest periods. And so your body can super compensate for the training stresses you place upon it. I'm just, you know, 
I'm a very big proponent of someone who says that a lot of times you need to take time off of training so that you can fix your life to make your training better. Does that, is that sort of the impression you got from the writings, Jared? Yeah. And I think that that's, um, I think it's really awesome that you do that. I mean, I've, uh, I've always been a fan of, you know, like deload weeks and stuff, um, Mm -hmm. uh, following powerlifting, uh, schemes and whatnot, you know, that that's big in there. And I just want to see how it worked for you because what you, what you do is uh, awesome. I think it's, uh, I like anyone who's trying to balance more than one thing. Uh, like it personally with the athletes I train and for myself, um, you know, we're on an, on the edge of, we want to have like the, the biggest deadlift with the fastest mile time, you know, and that, and that's not easy to do when you're trying to balance two different things, um, in one, uh, you know, training session or over the course of 12 weeks or a year or whatever. Uh, so I want to know about you, uh, balancing tricking and, uh, bodybuilding. Have you found that to be really difficult, um, to do? Is it, a? I guess I'll just leave it at that. Is it, is it really difficult to balance those two? Yeah, absolutely. It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, and, it's an art, man. Uh, it's it, it's a completely an art. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to kind of dive into a little bit more because I think some people might, from the outsider's perspective, if they don't know a lot about training, they'd be like, "Oh, well, that guy just he he does some bodybuilding, and then he you know he does some tricking, and that's how he is, how he is." But man, the years and years of work that you have to put in, and the balance, and uh, you know every aspect that goes into your training. Uh, what's been some of the biggest hurdles in trying to uh, maintain that that flexibility and ability to be acrobatic with uh, gaining muscle mass and you know being anabolic? Well, you sort of actually hinted at the answer there in your question, where you said years and years. The thing is that if you want to be able to do uh, two things like this that seem to contradict each other on the surface, like being a large guy that can do feats of flexibility and agility, including like acrobatic skills. I mean, it's, look, you don't usually see like a giant guy doing flips and, and kicks and stuff in the air, like really gracefully. It's just like, how do those things fit together? The thing is that you don't build them at the same time. You build them one at a time. So uh, it, it goes back to the uh, periodization thing where years and years. So it's like you might focus on bodybuilding for a season. You make permanent or semi-permanent gains uh, and improvements in that respect. And then you'll do a quick switch and go back to the other one where you focus more on acrobatic skills, tricking, uh, anything like that. You'll make uh, permanent, semi-permanent gains in that again, and then you'll make the switch again. So the uh, the thing that you're going to judge whether someone is doing a good job or not is how efficient their training is. is you can quickly make adaptations and you're very good at both of them you'll be able to make you know bodybuilding gains in you know a month and a half rather than two and a half months and then you'll be able to make that switch sooner before your before your uh your tricking gains or the other skill that you put on the back burner has too much time to start to fall apart so you have to be able to switch back and forth rapidly which means you have to be able to make improvements rapidly which means you have to know what you're doing and that's the thing is most people um See, bodybuilding training methodology is its own thing, and tricking training and training for acrobatics is almost a completely different thing. So you're you're having to be good at two different things. You're having to switch back and forth. So it takes years to be able to know what you're doing and be able to actually go into a training phase for either one of them and actually make it – what's the word? Uh, Productive. You actually have to know what you're doing to make the training period productive so that you can actually make the most of it before you switch again. And you just have to switch back and forth. And over time, what happens is you end up like me. You just wake up one day and you're like, fuck, I'm the anabolic acrobat. You know, (laughs) (laughs) that's what happens one day. You just wake up and that's it, you know, but I tell you right now, uh, since things started picking up for me with social media and opportunities and, uh, you know, online work and, it's more of like I'm always having to do performances and, and guest appearances and seminars and stuff. So I've been mainly just balancing the two um, in a maintenance phase for the most part for the past couple of years. Uh, just kind of – it's easier to maintain both of them than improve either one of them or both of them at the same time. I hope that answers your question. I hope your readers didn't get – or listeners didn't get lost here. <laughs> oh, no, man. That's uh, – I think it's a really good picture on what it takes to uh, master uh, – master your art or your craft and, and what you, you call that, uh, acrobolics, correct? Yeah. That's the, that's the coinage I, I created for it. And have you found that, uh, catching on with other people? Are there a lot of people interested in, in following or like, you know, asking for, 
your program or, you know, a, a lot of that stuff? You know, honestly, no. Um, it's interesting. They're they're more interested in me than uh, the branding Acrobolics. They're more interested in Juji Mufu than Acrobolics, and that's okay. I mean, it doesn't like make me feel bad or make me feel less than about the whole thing. It's just I think most people, honestly, they don't. They just want to be able to like do a couple flips and you know look a little better. They don't need to do all the. I don't think they really look at the wide skill set I have in tricking and think, oh, I want to do it all. I think they just want to do a few moves here and there, you know. Yeah, you're you're Everest, and they just want to go on a hike. Yeah, and that's fine. Uh, I love that. I mean, I respect that totally too. And I do have a question uh, since you brought that up. Um, so, say I start carving out, let's say an hour a day, three days a week, and I want to be able to do a backflip. What is your? And I'm doing it at home, and I'm by myself. What are your recommendations uh, for for learning how to do that? Well, first of all, I like the fact that. Uh, you just you, <laughs> you you did something right there. I don't think you realize you did. Um, most people who are going to ask me the question you just ask are going to ask me how do you do the skills if I carve out uh, three three hours and three times a week. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. What you need to do is pick one skill and go with it. So this the fact that you immediately just said, how about just the backflip? Now you're on the right track. See what you do is you learn that one move, and it's a gateway to other things if you want it to be. But you got to get that first move so in terms of the backflip what you got to do is realize that there's no one workout that you need for the backflip you break the skill down and you can come up with several components to train on on their own you know it's the analytical approach so uh jared let's break the backflip down real quick okay what you need so when was the last time you jumped uh i jump a couple times a week probably (laughs) that's good um how much how much do you weigh and how tall are you um 185 uh 511 See, that's like the perfect height for this and, and weight, you know, that's just like, that's, that's fit. And you jump, uh, several times a week. How good is your upper back flexibility, your thoracic mobility? Uh, I would say pretty good. Pretty good. Good. O- overall, I'm a pretty flexible guy. Yeah. Not, not to your level with the uh, splits on the chair, but pretty flexible. Well, that's fine. You don't need the splits for the chair to be able to do the backflip, you know? But, uh, if you look at the movement, there's a large upper back stretch at the top of the, uh, at the peak before you roll over at the top. Okay. So, um, upper backs loosened up, your abs are loosened up. Uh, you jump a few times a week. You're at the right, uh, weight for this. So, um, the next thing you need to do is how familiar are you with the skill? Because, um, one of my favorite analogies is this hardware software, uh, kind of thing, dualism going on where it's just like my, the example I give people is like, uh, Jared, you have the right hardware for doing a backflip. So you got to install the software, okay? So your computer is good enough to run this software, which is a backflip. It's a pretty simple software, but it takes time to install it. So what you got to do is you have to install this program, which means you have to actually study it. So, I mean, if you can visualize in your head, how well can you visualize a backflip? Can you see it? Can you actually point out different things that are going on? Do you actually understand the technique well enough to have a discussion about it? That's a question. At this point, no. Yeah. No. Okay, so that's what you need to do. So I can tell you when I got my backflip, um, I was in a similar situation as you where I was the right size and uh, I was already tricking and jumping. I was just scared of doing it. The fear of what was, the fear is what holds people back at that point, right? So I, I bet you're scared of doing it, right? Yeah, and what's funny about it is um, the only times I've ever actually practiced have been into a pool. Uh, but then something, and I could do front flips into a pool, somersault into a pool, but then like whenever I, there's like some talking about software, there's some like bug in my software that I need to work on because every time I try a backflip, my brain like freaks out and I end up doing this like really cool, like twist somersault, like really awesome flip. Everyone says it looks really cool, but I'm trying to do a backflip every time and I can't do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It sounds like you got a. It sounds like you got a glitch. You got to reinstall the software. <laughs> yeah, I got to got to pull myself out of the matrix for a minute. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I could tell you uh, what you're going to do then, and what I did was you study backflip videos. You look at them in slow mo. You look at them at full speed. You got to look at them in both. You got to be able to understand the technique in full speed, not just slow mo. And you just look at different people do it. You listen to a lot of tutorials. Um, And you just visualize it in your head in first person and third person. You don't just pick one or the other. So you got to be able to see yourself do it and be able to actually imagine what it's like to do it. And you do this, uh, you know, several times a week. You study videos of it. You think about it throughout the day. And it's it's like a magical moment because – 
in like two or four weeks when you start doing that and you're continuing to jump and practice, you know, jumping up and down. So your body is in the right physical state to be able to do it. It's receptive to it in that respect. All of a sudden you're going to wake up one day and it's just like you solved the problem and you got the solution. You're going to be like, I can backflip. I get it. I understand it. It happens. It happens with tricks. It happens with skills like that. You're just going to wake up one day after enough study and thinking about it. And it's just, you're just going to get it. You're just, all of a sudden you have this confidence. Like, I know I can do this. I can. And so what you do at that point is, uh, don't ever jump into a pool again. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not the right learning method. What you do is, uh, you get a spotter, which is someone like a friend to stand beside you. And there's a certain way to do it. Basically they have one hand on your lower back and one hand on your hamstring. And they're not touching, but when you jump up, they kind of throw you over. So they take the bottom hand, they take your hamstring and throw you over and kind of support you with their other hand as you attempt the backflip. So, um, there's tutorials online for how to properly spot a backflip. But see, the thing is that the fear is going to have you keep doing this, this fancy twisting thing that you're doing now. It's, it's a glitch. In, or, in order to get over the fear, see, the whole thing about fear is it's just a result of infamiliarity. If you're familiar with something, you're automatically winning the battle against fear. The more familiar you are with something, the, the less the fear is going to be. So what you got to do is just familiarize yourself more and more with it by studying it and think about it. And then one day you're going to actually be able to chuck it. And if you chuck it with the right person helping you, you're going to jump over. And after about two or three attempts, you're going to be like, I got this crap. And you're going to do it within 10 minutes. You're going to have that backflip, man. Awesome, dude. And I'm going to, I'm going to start working on it. I'm going to send you a video when I, when I nail it. Do you think I can do it in a month's time frame? Oh yeah. Yeah. Actually I'm writing a program right now. I'm going to sell It's another ebook. It's called uh backflips and biceps. So, uh, it's got like, I'm on it. yeah, it's got different backflip workouts in there, but I gave you a little preview of what you need to do personally. So start studying it, man. And then get a spotter. Perfect, dude. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to switch gears on you now. Uh, so this is what we call the book question and we love to give it to our listeners. Uh, our, I say my listeners love it. I love to give the question. Uh, so say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented, uh, and the president calls you up and he says, you're responsible for one chapter of this new book that's going into every single school. So every single child in America, they're going to have to read your chapter and be tested on and pass before they're allowed to graduate high school. What would your chapter be about? Oh man, that's a tough question. This is a weird one. <laughs> they have to they have to know how to There's a there's a test on a chapter in this book. I'm sorry, you're going to have to, I feel dumb right now. What's the book about uh, again? No, so yeah, it's a, it'll be just a, a book that's given to every child in America, so like part of uh, all schools. And say there's like 100 chapters in the book, and then John Call gets to write one book. And you can write about anything you want, anything you think would be important for uh, you know young people to learn before they graduate high school. Okay. Um, you know what? The, uh, the answer to that question would probably depend on, on the mood of the season I'm in. But I could tell you, uh, I, I guess right now, it's completely unfitness-related. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I love, love kind of like uh, getting into knowing who you are a little bit more. Sure. Um, I would make the uh, chapter about uh, how to make friends, I guess, or what it means to be a friend or what it takes to have friends. Because it's only something I learned in the past few years when it just sort of clicked for me when I understand like what it actually meant. And uh, what does it mean to you right now? It's, uh, I mean, friendship to me is, you know, it only started to make sense to me, honestly, when I started running my own business. When I, when I started like, you know, doing more business activities and I realized that friendship is an exchange, it's, uh, and then it started to really click with me, like, like the mistakes that I make and all these other people around me make when it comes to maintaining friendships. It's, 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 it's interesting. Um, some of the biggest mistakes are that people don't ask for things from their friends. So, I mean, I believe was it Dale Carnegie who wrote how to win friends and influence people? Honestly, I I feel bad that I've only read like a few chapters here and there throughout the book. I should probably read the whole thing since I'm talking about this, but uh, he's, he's probably, he wrote a whole book on probably something that I'm about to say here, but um, it's, 
most people don't ask people for free things in a friendship and you're depriving the other person of providing you some sort of value because they feel like they're being selfless by not asking for things where it honestly builds up a, some sort of resentment in them. Like the other person, does, they, they, people expect people to give them other things. It's just, you need to ask people for things. You, get, you need to make them feel useful. You need to put them to use. You need to be like, you need to, you, you need to use people. I mean, as, as bad as it sounds right off the surface level, it's not. It's the way it works. You need to use people and then you need to give back to them. You need to feel like you need to identify what value you have in the relationship. And a lot of times, uh, for example, one of the things I do is this sounds crazy, but I keep a spreadsheet with a bunch of my friends on it. And I'll write down the last time that we've been in contact and the last thing that I did for them. And a lot of times, if I'll go through that spreadsheet, I'd be like, look, this person's important to me because one day I might need them again, you know, for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to contact him out of the blue. I'm going to be the one to reach out and reestablish contact and just maintain the friendship. I mean, friendship's about strategy, man. It's you got to maintain these things. You can't just like not talk to your old time friend for like years and just. You, you got to maintain your friendships. You got to strategize them. You got to you got to look at what the exchange is. You got to use them, and you got to provide value for them the best you can, even if they're not asking for it. So it's just a back and forth thing. Um, sorry, I'm just sort of rambling right now. So <laughs> no, man, I love it. And uh, you said you kind of uh, stumbled into that recently. Um, you know, having to do more business stuff. And I, I did see um, on your YouTube channel. Uh, you know, you recently went full time with the things that you're doing now. Is that correct? It is correct. Yes, it's uh, and ha- uh go ahead. I was just say how how's that been going? Oh, it, it's 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 better than I thought it would be, honestly. Um, you know, when I uh quit my day job, I was really anxious about it the day I handed in the paper and most people will tell you that they're they're worried for the first week and then they all all of a sudden they they wonder how they ever did but did it in the first place. Well, I was actually fine right after I, the hardest part was handing in the resignation letter and then I was like, "Whoa, I'm okay, you know." <laughs> but uh And uh no, yeah, I, I completely agree. So I left the uh, the military uh, with a, a, a white skin. You know, uh, anyway, so I know uh, the the fear of leaving something that's uh, you know ultra stable to to go out on your own. It's it's a terrifying feeling. But now, yeah, I look back at and I, I couldn't imagine it any other way. Um, so I, I do want to talk about uh, you know maybe your plans for the future. Um, I like to ask anyone running their own business, kind of if they have like a vision or a way forward that they are some big dream that they're after. And if not, that's okay too. I just, uh, I always like to ask that question. Are you still there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. (laughs) I was listening to you. I I didn't hear I didn't see the question mark up here, I guess. I was waiting for you to finish the question. (laughs) Yeah. I must've cut off like right at the, the last word. No worries. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, I was just saying, uh, so running your own business, I was going to see if you had like a big goal or dream uh, of, you know, for your business or something that you're trying to, because, you know, your business is all about uh, helping people and providing value, right? So what's the biggest value that you're you're trying to give to people uh, in this journey of running your own business? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, it's, just, I mean, from the very simplest way, it's just to continue to provide entertainment value to people, make them feel more welcome in the fitness world to make them, make them feel like they have a spot in it. Like it's fun. It's okay. It's not scary. Uh, working out doesn't have to be this arduous sacrifice that a lot of people make it out to be just to make themselves feel look cooler or more badass. Nah, it's just, look, you don't have to beat the shit out of yourself to get good results for training. It could be ultra fun. It could be ultra awesome. And you can like, it's just, you know, I just want to convey that message to people. I see too much crap in the industry where it's like the really hardcore, ultra brutal workouts are the only way to achieve results. It's like, you know, a lot of people don't want to want to see that it doesn't have to be like that. You know, it can be something that's just fun and enjoyable and you can get what you want out of it but you know and that makes it even more appealing because then you're not just focused on the freaking results you know you're focused on how to make it just better just for everyone including yourself along the way but i mean that's just sort of the the message i'm trying to convey through what i do and um but i mean more tangible goal would be uh, uh this is gonna be a little crazy but um you know you want to know why i do both tricking and bodybuilding of course. Okay. Um, 
it works out like this. If you want to go practice acrobatic skills, you probably want to do it at a gymnastics gym, right? Right. Because the flooring they have is carpeted. It's a large, even surface that's predictable. And uh, the plyometric flooring is a plywood base with these really, really hard springs underneath just to give you a nice little cushion. So when you do your moves, you can practice in the optimal environment. Okay. Now, if I wanted to go and practice some skills, I couldn't do it. You want to know why? Because you can't go anytime you want. You know, you got to either be taking a class at the facility and be part of the team or the squad, kind of like, you know, a CrossFit box is sort of uh, organized in the same way. Or you have to come during open gym time if they even have it. And it's usually at one of the most inconvenient times you could ever imagine, like nine o'clock on a mm-hmm. Thursday night. Who the hell wants to be doing thir- flips at nine o'clock on a Thursday night, starting their workout that late when they got to be at work the next morning, you know? So it, look, I'm sounding angry right now because I get really worked up about how wrong this actually is and how much opportunity there is to make it a better way to do it so that, look, a lot of people don't do the stuff I do, the tricking stuff, because it's so inaccessible. I can go to a Gold's Gym or a 24E or any sort of uh, fitness center that's just, they're everywhere. I can go lift weights anywhere I want, anytime I want, within miles of me. If I want to go practice tricking or gymnastics, what do I do? you got to find a gym that's actually going to have open gym, and it's going to be at some weird, inconvenient time. You can't put in the training. You can't find the opportunity to fit the training in. So what do you do? You do what I do, where if you notice most of my videos, they're all outside. There's a reason for that. It's because I'm trying to do this stuff and there's no place to do it other than grass outside, you know, and during the winter time, it's miserable because it's muddy, it's cold. And you just, you're out there like bundled up in like coats and wearing vibram five fingers and all sorts of crap, trying to do really crappy moves in the worst weather imaginable because there's no opportunity to train this stuff like (laughs) anytime you want, you know? So what I did during those times is I focused on bodybuilding instead and weightlifting and other, you know, feats of strength and stuff because I could always go to a gym and then it would warm up in the spring and summer and I'd start tricking again. So my periodization in the beginning was sort of a discovery of, was sort of discovered through this sort of limitation I had on when I could actually practice what I wanted to practice, you know? So it became winter time was weightlifting and summertime was tricking and it just flip flop back and forth until all of a sudden I started to realize it was a thing. And you know, that's uh that's pretty awesome because you mentioned CrossFit gyms and I, I actually have a joke uh, with my buddies because uh, you know, my entire uh, business right now is uh, centered on uh, helping garage gym athletes, people training at home and, uh, you know, early on, I did get into CrossFit. Now I, I call more what I do strength and conditioning, but uh, I'm very much along the same lines. If I think if CrossFit had a different model and just let me train when I wanted to train and how I wanted to train, uh, whatever, 10 years ago, I might not even be doing what I'm doing today. Uh, because <laughs> You're in the same boat as me, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I was looking. I was like, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. None of you guys will let me. So, okay, I'll train in my garage. I'll develop my own programs, you know, like so on and so forth. And that's just the whole thing has snowballed from there, which is it's really crazy. I mean, to a certain extent, me and you have to both thank the limitations for making us who we are. But to to another extent, I mean, that's you asked me what my goal is in doing this. It's to change that model. I want to, you know, if I could open a, a series of gyms or something that had a lot of profile on social media and people started to see a different type of model of gym, it might change physical culture for the better, better by actually offering these type of opportunities, you know, like, hey, you can put a gymnastic floor next to a CrossFit area next to a bodybuilding area and you could do it anytime you want. And it really f-ing works, you know, <laughs> it's a, it's not I, you don't find those places anywhere, man. They don't exist almost. I don't know of any. I don't either, man. I will. I mean, when you open one up, I'll uh, I'll be sure to stop by. Do it and and, <laughs> Have your and show you my yeah and show you my backflip. That's my main goal. Uh, all right, man. So um, I do want to ask one more question before we get into the quick fire questions and then the question of the show. And I really want to just talk about since we've kind of been you know for the last couple of minutes talking about uh, you know your business and and going full time. Uh, just following your passion, man. Because uh, I think. A lot of people are passionate about something that they're not doing. Um, and uh, I think fitness, that was always that way for me when I had a full-time job. 
Um, and I just want to talk, you know, ask you about your journey and following your passion and how that's been over the years to, you know, get where you finally are today. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, well, I mean, my passion has always been in, uh, you know, doing these things that I discussed when you asked me like who it was, I am, you know, the, the martial arts, the tricking, the weightlifting, the bodybuilding. I mean, the thing is I just quit my day job, like in December, it's March right now. So like four months ago, um, I'm 31 years old. Uh, it took me that long to do that. But the thing is that I did it because now I figured out a way to monetize the things that I really love to do that I'm going to be doing anyway. So, I mean, if you, if you can't, you know, make your passion, your day job or whatever, you just have to ask yourself, like, would I be doing this anyway? I, I would be, I was doing it anyway. I would continue to be doing it anyway. I just finally figured out a way to, to monetize it. So, I mean, if it's something you really like, you're going to do it anyway. But I recommend people figure out a way to monetize it sooner rather than later because it's so much more fun when you make a little bit of money doing something you really like to do, man. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right, man. I appreciate that. Now I'm going to transition to the quick fire questions of the show. So what is the hardest workout you've ever done? Uh, it's going to sound really crazy, but arms with C.T. Fletcher. Okay. All right. Uh, it was I'm 45, it was, why. it was, yeah. <laughs> it was 45 minutes of arms. You're like, shouldn't that be like a deadlifting or squat workout that, you know, shouldn't something now it was 45 minutes of arms with CT Fletcher. I couldn't even pick up a piece of paper after I was done. I couldn't actually close my fingers. Like I couldn't close the gap between my thumb and my index finger. That's how messed up my forearms were from that workout. It was just like 200 rep sets. I mean, you see that crap online and it seems like a gimmick. And honestly, I would never <laughs> want to do it again. <laughs> it was just, that sounds pretty I don't, I don't think I got anything from it other than being able to answer this question. That was the hardest work <laughs> I've ever done was uh, freaking arms of CT Fletcher. That's awesome. I mean, in your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Oh, I uh, see the best activity for building mental toughness. Hmm. You know, I, I want to say that there, there really is none. Everyone's different. Everyone's going to have a different activity. They need a different form of mental toughness. Like I'm pretty mentally tough in certain respects, but I'm a big wuss in other respects. Like, you know, like, I don't know if you watch me and my wife on a daily basis, you'd be like, why is he so moody all the time? And in, in this, you know, when it comes to this, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, in other respects, it's just like, I'm, I'm perfectly like, I got it dialed in, but it just depends on what you need. I would start small though. And, you know, just pick may, may, maybe this, maybe this answer, man. Uh, pick one thing and just, you know, one small thing and just do that, you know? Okay. If you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, it would have to be a barbell and some weights, man. All right. Awesome. All right, man. Then this is the last question and uh, the question of the show. So what is your best advice you have for becoming a better human? And this is 100% open-ended. Okay. My advice for being a hundred percent better human. That's that. That's the question. Best advice for becoming a better human. Oh. And it's open a hundred percent open ended. So it could be anything. Okay. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Try this. Try this one. Um, smiling isn't a weakness and neither is being able to laugh at something. Just because, uh, you know, you laugh at something doesn't mean you're not taking it seriously. So, I mean, it, it's sort of like a light attitudes, heavy weights type thing. Um, these are different, like, buzzwords you can throw around. But, I mean, what I really mean is um, there's a movie called Trains, Planes, and Automobiles. It's an old movie from the 80s. You probably don't remember it. I don't know. I was a kid when it came out. But there's a certain part of the movie where uh, – where they almost die, okay? And uh, John Candy, you still there? Yeah. You're a good listener, man. I love you. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a part in the movie where John Candy, uh, he's a dead actor. Uh, after they almost die, the other actor, uh, uh, Steve Martin, he's mad at, at John, and he's yelling at him. And uh, John is saying, uh, it's okay, man. We can laugh about it now. You know, like, it's all over. We can laugh about it now. It's just like... The sooner that you can start laughing about something, it, it means you're over it. You know what I mean? Like, 
when people are always like heavily weighted by these burdens and sacrifices and badges of honor and these big things and they think they're doing these so important tasks and stuff it's like they're they're weighted by the world by this this large burden they have like it's just, if you can laugh about it man that means you're above it so i mean in order to be a better human what i really recommend is try to be able to laugh at uh, things that are giving you difficulty sooner rather than later, because only then do I really think you're over it and when you've really mastered it and you're above it. If you can sit there and laugh at yourself, that's the best thing. That's the best feeling. And a lot of people take themselves too seriously. And I love making fun of myself, man. I love it when people, I, lo- I love beating people to the punch too. I love uh, self deprecating myself. I love it because it's just fun. And it's just, it makes it so much more real for me and everyone else. And it's just, Having a sense of humor about yourself and the things you do and and just the hardships you go through and just being able to laugh at things. It's just like you're above the world, like you're more free than you could ever feel. And it takes time. It's not like just a switch you flip and it's like it is a cheesy decision you make. It takes time. But after months and years pass by and you start to do this more and more, you realize like – Holy shit, this is so much better way to live. Why did and you feel like you're in a matrix. Everyone's taking everything so seriously. You're just walking around just like a clown. You're just like, this is awesome. It's like this is this is great. I'm just laughing at everything. And it's that's I don't know. It's it just feels good. And you love everyone so much more when when you have that mindset. I love that answer, man. I think that's uh that's a great way to to approach life. <laughs> All right, dude. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the podcast. But I know a lot of the listeners are going to want to check uh, you out if they don't already know. So where could they, you know, maybe uh, where could they go online to find out more about you? Uh, where can they get your book? Things like that. Sure. So uh, the first place is uh, my Instagram slash Jujimufu, J-U-J-I-M-U-F-U. That's Instagram. Um, so, you know, in the in regards to the last question where I'm talking about having a sense of humor and having fun, uh, go check out my Instagram account. It's my biggest social media account. And you can see just by clicking a lot of my videos through that, man, they're stupid. There's so much stupid crap in there. But seriously, like at the same time, I'm doing some pretty impressive things I'm proud of. So uh, that's that. go there. You go to my YouTube channel slash Jujimufu as well. You can go to my website slash www.acrobolics.com. I have a web shop there where you can also buy my ebook. Uh, legendary flexibility. So I wrote a book about flexibility. Um, if you're at all interested in flexibility, you need to read the book. It's it's super fun read too. It's it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's a funny book as well. So uh, go there, and that's I think that's good, man. I mean, I really appreciate you uh, allowing me to plug some stuff here. Yeah, man. And I'll uh, when I publish this uh, on my site, I'll make sure I link out to everything. So anyone listening, they can. Uh, uh, you know, go go check out his stuff. But if you're not following on Instagram already, uh, make sure that you do that. But John, I really appreciate your time today, and thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you, absolutely. <laughs> Keep doing what you do, man. Thanks, man. always whine about their best. <laughs>